Hello and welcome to our Today All Day special, Cracking the Case, America's Obsession with True Crime. I'm Gotti Schwartz and we're at Othram Labs in Houston for an incredible story we're going to get to later in our show. But first, we set the scene. Why is it that our society is so obsessed with true crime? Let's take a deeper look. We have a kidnapping. All right, please. Explain to me what's going on, okay? There, we have a, there's a note left and our daughter's gone. From John Benet Ramsey and O.J. Simpson. He started yelling, he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me. I said, well, who, who is going to kill you? She said, O.J. To Natalie Holloway and Gabby Petito. Justice for Gabby is that we see justice for her homicide. True crime has captivated audiences for years with no end in sight. An explosion of true crime content on television with shows like Dateline and Tiger King leaving viewers transfixed and searching for more. In fact, audience demand for true crime has grown more than 73% in the documentary streaming space. But the largest platform? Podcasts, where 62 million Americans a year listen to deep dives of intricate cases. I think there's something about these cases that feels unfinished. We want to try and understand why it happened. For Ashley Flowers, an interest turned into a true crime empire started by her podcast, Crime Junkie. I was always what I now call a crime junkie. Making it a career was a totally different journey and I wanted to find a way to actually start making a difference and not just listen or read these stories. True crime's impact close to home for Kim Goldman, who experienced the death of her brother, Ron Goldman, in the public eye. My brother's case is still relevant today because it was the first opportunity that we had to peek inside a courtroom to understand how money and celebrity and race plays a part. And with the internet being what it is and social media being what it is, it allows the new generation, the younger generation to peek in again and it just drums up a tremendous amount of energy. Goldman recently launched a new podcast, Media Circus, to hear the stories of victims. Having been the subject of a high profile case for so long, I was first in line to see how mistruths and rumors and conspiracies and negativity can be incredibly damaging to the, the healing process and to grief. Others are turning to social media like TikTok to amplify cases. I got into true crime TikTok because I wanted to see people of my skin tone being represented. I wanted to be one of the first. Kimberly Chapman, also known as True Crime Kimberly, has amassed over 800,000 followers for her takes on captivating cases. It's just mind blowing how people can, can commit such crazy acts and get away with it. I just wanna know what's going through those people's head when they're doing those things. What started as one hot take became a TikTok phenomenon. From that video, it really just took off and the comments was filled with people saying, talk about this person and talk about that and I have a missing person that I want you to talk about. But what's behind this American obsession with true crime? We ask psychologist Shavana Childs. We deep dive into it so that we can get the whole picture. We want to know how this person ticks. We want to know what was behind the story. It's a look into their deeper lives. Women are particularly interested in true crime because it becomes a template of what not to do, of how to save themselves should they find themselves in similar situations. We want to know that we can survive. And is there such a thing as too much true crime? Dr. Childs warns psychological impacts can occur. If you find that you're losing sleep, if you find that you're isolating from your friends, if you find that you're nervous in situations that you typically wouldn't be because you've been watching true crime, it might be time to pull back. But the public's interest in true crime doesn't look like it's slowing down, impacting lives across the world. I think the future of true crime media is figuring out how we can do it in the most ethical way possible. And I think that is ensuring that we're working in tandem with, with victims, with law enforcement, making sure, most importantly, that we're not re-traumatizing victims and their families by telling these stories. If people like myself are gonna operate in the true crime space, then we need to find a way to give back. And I think that is gonna be a lot more mainstream coming in the future. You might know actress Marisol Nichols from the show Riverdale, but far from the glitz and glamour of Hollywood, Nichols has assumed a role of a lifetime, a real-life undercover operative working to end human trafficking. In her acting career spanning nearly three decades, Marisol Nichols has played detectives, Freeze! Hands in the air! principals, okay, I won't suspend her if you do me one favor, and CEOs. I have a ton of work to do. Come with me. 
comedy where? She's best known for her work on hit show Riverdale. Your disrespect will no longer be tolerated. Not by me and certainly not by your father when he comes home. But it's her role out of the spotlight she's most proud of. It's described as an undercover operative. What does that mean? I'm literally undercover pretending to be someone else into a situation where we're infiltrating different scenarios. As a licensed informant, Nichols helps crack down on human trafficking, a $150 billion industry that involves labor and sexual exploitation. One in four victims of modern slavery are children, according to the International Labor Organization. Leaning on her acting prowess, Nichols has posed as just about everything to lure perpetrators in, even a young child as seen here. What was going through your mind in that first operation? I'll never forget this one guy. He's like, hey, kiddo. And I wanted to just like, you want to reach through the phone and just annihilate this person. And you can't. Because I need, to, I need to make this guy and these men come out of hiding who have done this so many times and are used to doing this, by the way. And I need them to show up because I've got a room full of law enforcement with semi-automatic weapons in the room next to me. And they're waiting to take these guys down and get them off the street. The 48-year-old partners with police, district attorneys, governments, and nonprofits like Operation Underground Railroad, founded by former special agent Tim Ballard. And when I met him, I was like, I've been looking for you. Because I'm, I go, it's great to wait, raise awareness, and that's wonderful, but I want to know who's getting the kids. Like, who is going out there and, like, rescuing these people? Is, is anyone doing this? And I was like, that's the guy. That introduction proved to be pivotal, pushing Nichols to the front lines of rescue operations that have led to the arrest of dozens of people. Being so close to this, this is dark stuff. Very. How do you cope? It's, it's, I'm not going to lie. It's, <laughs> I don't come home normal. Some of the things that I've done have brought me to very dark, dark, dark places on the planet. But then I go, if my kid was taken and that was my kid, I would hope to God that someone else would risk their life for her. The risks are not lost on Nichols. She's a 13-year-old daughter at home and thinks of her often ahead of operations, which can get messy. Was there ever a moment where you're like, oh, should I be doing this? Is this too risky? A hundred percent. The last one I did, I wrote a letter to my kid because it was pretty dangerous. And I'm like, if I don't come back from this, I don't want her to be mad that I died saving someone else's kid, essentially. So I wrote a letter to her to explain to her like why I was doing this. Nichols says as a survivor of sexual assault in her adolescence, the mission is personal for her. And I got raped a bunch by a bunch of guys. And it, it was pretty traumatizing. I woke up in the police department. I didn't know what happened. To this day, I don't remember much. Years later, Nichols leaned on the Church of Scientology to pull her away from drugs and improve her mental health. We pressed her on recent accusations in a lawsuit of trafficking within the church. Accusations the church denied in a statement to NBC News, saying in part, the allegations are both scurrilous and ridiculous, and the lawsuit is both a sham and scam. Has that ever given you pause? Uh, no, not in the least. It's so absurd, and for me, I know what I've seen, I know what I've experienced in Scientology. It saved my life. She's set to take a deep dive of the ups and downs in her life and volunteer work in a new podcast released this month. What's your hope? What's your goal for your efforts? My goal is to have enough good people know about this so that they demand an end to it. Still to come, celebrity medium Tyler Henry and mom Teresa share their personal true crime story in their first sit-down interview. And later, how this forensic lab is working to make cold cases obsolete. Stay with us. Welcome back. If you've read the news, odds are you've seen coverage of true crime cases, but most of that coverage seems to spotlight missing and murdered white women. Jennifer Buckley is working to change that. Take a look. Jennifer Buckley carefully applies red paint to her hand. The paint is symbolic. It speaks of violence, of silence, and resilience. It's art intended to have an impact, to awaken a state and a continent to the tragedy of missing and murdered indigenous women. I think collectively it just doesn't seem like our indigenous lives are as important as some others. It doesn't matter if it's on the reservation, off the reservation, um, 
when people go missing, they're not looked for the same way. Missoula, Montana County Attorney Kirsten Pabst. It's an epidemic. It is a huge problem in Montana. Our missing persons, when you look at the numbers, 25 to 30 percent of our missing persons are native. They only make up about six to seven percent of our population. There are issues of jurisdiction whose problem, tribal or municipal and state, local or even federal law enforcement. What do you think the roots of it are? I think you have to go back hundreds of years to colonization and um, cultural degradation, cultural degradation of our Native American cultures. And you combine that with this um, surge of methamphetamine and domestic violence that we're seeing today. We're to the point now where we have to do something different. For an epidemic mostly unnoticed and rarely publicized, that something different fell to Jen Buckley, who is an enrolled member of the Chippewa Cree tribes out of Rocky Boy, Montana. I just came up with a, well, maybe I'll just see if anybody wants to get their picture taken with the red handprint on their face to raise awareness. So that's how it started. One of the first places the photos landed was in the office of the county prosecutor. It's so powerful because, not only because of the intense and beautiful images, but you almost also capture the isolation visually as well. But so many of um, the murdered and missing women face. When you decided to put these up in your office, I mean, it just speaks volumes to you guys. You know what I mean? You putting these up is such a platform. And it just was really humbling. Jen, though, began to dream bigger, much bigger. I just started to think, like, what is a large-scale thing that people see that they have to see? And it, it, I just like, oh, I don't know, there's billboards. Lamar Billboards donates the space, but Jen and her project are on a shoestring budget. I can raise the $200, it's up for a month, and then it comes down because I, I gotta wait till I have the, the next $200 to put it back up. Funded by the sales of her photos, the occasional donation, Jen has bigger dreams. My hope is definitely that I can get them up permanently, not only in Montana, but through the United States and into Canada. It's needed because too often the attention goes elsewhere. Just look at that white female that went missing from New York that was found dead in Wyoming and how much national exposure she got with a Gabby and how many Native American females went missing in that same time period and there was nothing. So. Not a blip. Veteran Missoula police detective Guy Baker. Those billboards are a great way to bring awareness to this very important issue. And uh, you know how many thousands of people driving by them every day see it. So Jen has done a, a good job of kind of making it a personal issue that yeah. people can relate to. Important to Detective Baker because maybe a billboard will help him solve a case he's worked on for years. The missing Jermaine Charlo. Jermaine is the niece, sister of Valinda Morjo, who volunteered to be photographed by Jennifer Buckley. The work Jennifer is doing is important. I'm hoping that her work reaches outside of Montana, that we can get billboards in New York, all the way down to Texas and up into Canada. This, this is crisis and it needs to stop. How is it for you to know your sister has been gone these years now? It's, it's been extremely hard the hardest thing I've ever been to. Maybe this could make a difference. It will. It will. I know it will. Coming up, celebrity medium Tyler Henry and his mom, Teresa, reveal their very own, very personal true crime mystery. She shares her story of kidnap, being raised by serial killers, and much more after the break. Welcome back. Reality television star Tyler Henry is known for his spot-on psychic readings, helping celebrities, and even working with law enforcement to solve cold cases. But now he's speaking out about a cold case that is very close to his heart. Take a look. How many R names can you think of in the family? Two. Okay. Because they are referencing the two R's. It keeps coming up. As Tyler Henry was finding fame as the star of E's Hollywood Medium, helping celebrities communicate with their loved ones from beyond the grave, even helping detectives and investigators solve cold cases. His own mother, Teresa Colwyn, was coping with a dark secret of her own. Three years ago, my mom discovered that she was taken as a baby. Before then, Teresa believed her mother was Stella Guidry Nessel, 
a career criminal who murdered and tortured two people in the Central Valley Motel. I still just can't come to terms with that part. I mean, it's one thing to murder someone, but to torture them. I think one of the important things we learned in this is really just the intergenerational effect of trauma. Stella's crimes devastating the lives of not only her victim's family, but Teresa's own family, too. This traumatic history revisited in Tyler's Netflix series, Life After Death. So your middle name was Weva, but this has you down as Java. So I know my birth certificate yeah. has been doctored. Teresa learning Stella was not her birth mother, her birth mother, now deceased, had been tricked by Stella. The exact circumstances still unknown. And she raised me and used me in a way that she needed to benefit herself. The series capturing Teresa's emotional reunion with her biological family. My feelings um, when I met with my biological family were actually bittersweet as well, because while I loved them and adored them immediately, they're just wonderful, wonderful people. I also felt a loss because I felt like, well, what if I had been able to be raised with them? Ironically, Tyler says his psychic abilities weren't able to reveal much about those closest to him. Really, for me, my process has to not be impeded by logic or by information. And so because it's me, because I have my own feelings and thoughts and expectations, that bias basically prevented me from being able to kind of connect intuitively. It was surreal, he says, to be on the other side of the reading for the first time. I felt like the tables kind of turned in the sense that I found myself in a very vulnerable position in a pursuit for answers. So I felt myself really feeling a sense of desperation. And I think it taught me and gave me an insight into closure. It's not really something you achieve as much as it's something that you have to kind of grow through and find acceptance around. For Teresa, the revelations brought an emotional release. Because I know I'm not related to her and I'm not like her. I know I'm a good person. But also raised new questions about the nature of family. It made me happy that Tyler doesn't have a grandmother who's a murderer. And the bittersweet part of that is that while she, it means that she's not my biological mother, it also means that my siblings that I love so much are not my biological siblings, but it doesn't matter because we're always going to be close. We learn in this journey the importance of asking questions. If there's blind spot, follow There's a up. reason. There's a reason. There are entire generations of silence, and it's yeah. important to break that silence and that the truth really can set you free. And coming up, we take you behind the scenes of some of the technology solving hundreds of cold cases. Stay with us. Welcome back and welcome to Authorum Lab. Since 2018, the technology in this lab has helped solve hundreds of cases. They've never let cameras in until now and we've got the exclusive first look on how they solve the otherwise unsolvable. This is no longer something you see on TV that solves some cases here or there. So all of these cases that we're looking at here, these are the unsolvable cases before you guys came along. Absolutely. Just outside of Houston, Authorum Labs is solving the unsolvable. So when it comes to your laboratory, when it comes to your tech and legacy tech, what's the, what's the main difference? So we're taking this really challenging evidence that's historically been unusable for testing, and then we're enabling testing, and then we're doing that with hundreds of thousands of markers instead of, say, tens of markers of what you do in a traditional forensic test. The Authorum team combines medical and genomic expertise to revolutionize how forensic DNA is processed. If you go to like one of those consumer DNA companies to learn about your ancestry, you spit in a tube, and, and you'll generate uh, about a thousand nanograms of DNA. At Authorum, like we, we work off 0.1 nanograms. Put it in perspective, how small is it? How small are we talking? So the equivalent would be a 15 human cells. If I touch David's shoulder right now, I've left hundreds of cells right here. We were able to identify a perpetrator from a 32-year-old sex assault murder of a 14-year-old girl in Las Vegas with 0.12 nanograms of DNA left. The lab's run by husband and wife duo David and Kristen Middleman. He handles the science, she does the business. So I met David um, working on DNA together at Baylor College of Medicine 20 years ago, so we both have a science background and DNA background. But oh, so you guys met in the lab? We did. Um, I made um, blind mice and he cured them. So He cured the blind he mice? He did, and so I thought if he could do that, you'd probably fix any problem I create, so <laughs> I married him. The problem they're tackling now, America's backlog of cold cases. Experts estimate there are more than 250,000 unsolved murders in the country. We're often the last hope 
Every time they give you that last bit of DNA or that last bit of evidence, that is someone's last chance of being identified. That is a family member's last chance of finding out what happened to their loved one and someone's last chance to get justice for what happened to the person that they lost. In 2018, we had noticed that several cases had been solved, the Golden State Killer, for example, using this type of technology, but but it was, it was from a bunch of different pieces, right? Correct. Was... And you notice that not all cases were being solved. And it really isn't justice unless you can provide it and apply it to every case. And that's when David said, well, there's no process to do so. And so he said, I'm going to build it. I'm going to build a forensic lab of the future. Here we're building kind of a molecular library of that DNA. So we're getting many copies of it, breaking it up into itty bitty pieces. And each little piece is like a book in the library that describes some component of the information about that case. And what this is, is a, it's the most powerful sequencer on earth. How often are you breaking cases like this? How often are you calling law enforcement and saying, hey, I think every we've day. got a hit? Every now, day. Now, every day. Every single one of the samples in here, these all represent people that, that have not been identified. Yeah, they, they either represent victims or suspects to crimes. And so there are, there are countless numbers of folks in here um, that have never been identified through traditional methods. In, in almost every case that we've run, we've returned information that's been useful to the investigation. So we've seen it all. We've worked on a body that was found in a sewage tank for, for decades. We've worked on remains from 1881. We have worked on um, burnt remains, charred remains, and these are things that weren't possible a few years ago. Making the impossible possible, helping families and law enforcement find answers like in the 1974 abduction and murder of 17-year-old Carla Walker took my whole family. We were still a close family, but it was, and I'm sure you hear this quite often, it was never the same. Dothram was able to process a tiny DNA sample from Carla's bra strap. I, I had to look up what a nanogram was. It was so small. Those results, along with some good detective work, led investigators to arrest Glenn McCurley in 2020. I got a call around near 6 o'clock p.m. And one of the investigating detectives said, well, we got him. And he told me Glenn Samuel McCurley. And I'd never heard that name. Glenn McCurley was sentenced to life in prison for Carla's murder last year. Othram tracks some of its successes on DNAsolves.com, where anyone can donate money to fund their work. We've raised over $400,000 from crowd funds, from philanthropists, from people across the country that are just willing to help solve these investigations help clear some of these backlogs and help become sort of the model for how this would work if there was federal funding. But now for the first time ever in a recent appropriations bill, Congress says it'll fund this type of forensic technology. With the work that you've done, what do you think forensics is going to look like in 10 years? So I think we'll live in a world where there are no backlogs. People don't have to wait decades to find out what happened to their loved one and perpetrators are caught the first time they commit a crime. So, so you, think that, you think that this could prevent crime in the future? I think it'd become a deterrent for crime. I would definitely think twice. I think if you've left DNA at a crime scene, it's a matter of time before someone like us or us processes that crime scene. Thank you for joining us this half hour for Cracking the Case, America's obsession with true crime. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and see you next time on Today All Day. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Find your favorite recipes, celebrity interviews, uplifting stories, shop our favorite deals, and so much more with the Today app. Download it now.